this is when I know I'm helpless. My hands are down there on the bed. I can't put them on again without calling to somebody for help. I can't smoke a cigarette or read a book. If that door should blow shut, I can't open it and get out of this room. I'm as dependent as a baby that doesn't know how to get anything except cry for it. Well, now you know, Wilma. Now you have an idea of what it is. I guess you don't know what to say. It's all right. Go on home. Go away like your family said. I know what to say, Homer. I love you. And I'm never going to leave you. Never. Hi, everybody. I'm Dan. And I'm Mike. So welcome to 15 Minute Film Fanatics. Here we are in season nine. Today, we have a request. Now this request came from Phil and Dave, both in New Jersey, and from Mark in Tennessee. Our first Tennessee request, Mike. We're, we we got that national, national audience. We do, now. we do. Our first request from the volunteer state. So today we're gonna be doing 1945, William Wyler, The Best Years of Our Lives, based upon the novel Glory for Me by McKinley Cantor, which, Mike, you may not know, is a novel written in verse. I did not know that. Yeah, and that becomes The Best Years of Our Lives. Now, this was, um, we're doing this also because it was requested, but also Mike had just seen it about a month ago, texted me and said, listen, let's do this for the show. I said, sounds great. So, Mike, in part one, we always talk about our overall take on the movie. What is it about this movie that you walk away with overall? I'll tell you, I had no expectations for this movie other than I knew, A, that it was famous, and B, that some people who had been in it had won the Academy Award. That's all I knew about it, but I'd, but I'd never seen it. And I will tell you, I don't think you get what you expect. I can imagine, I know the DVD cover that I got, and I can imagine other posters. Um, I should probably go Google some other posters, but I guarantee you, the posters cannot sum up in an image what's going on in this movie. I have a hard time thinking about a movie that made me sadder. I have a hard time thinking of a movie with a more satisfying ending. The only thing that I can really think of that in terms of in terms of highs and lows and final resolution, um, and I don't know if this is a selling point for some people, it's almost as if Jane Austen had written the return home novel uh, of soldiers track them perfectly structured it and then brought it to a resolution. Um, but it, it sort of has like a strange Mansfield park structure. Uh, it takes you through the lowest steps you could possibly go. And it leaves you right where you did not know that you wanted to be. But honestly, this movie could have been anything. And I would have, I would have believed that it was famous, but the, performances sell it a hundred percent i like i didn't think that you could carry a movie with that many different narrative points of view but boy can you and they do an excellent job dramatizing the american city uh in in believable ways because i think uh it's it's sort of a stratified culture where somebody's middle class somebody's lower class somebody's upper class it's not supposed to be class commentary, but it is supposed to be realistic and naturalistic that all these three universes could exist at the same time, but not overlap or touch unless there had been a chance encounter uh, by which essentially they, they come into relationship to one another. Uh, I find that really, really, really interesting. And somehow William Wyler just gets the best performances uh, out of out of each person because everybody's like a hair breath from breaking down into melodrama, but everything stays right where it should be. A hundred thousand percent. That is your mic drop. For those of you who don't receive regular texts from Mike about movies, one of the things that Mike will text you, if you go to watch a movie that he really, really loves, I'll say, all right, I'm about to watch the best years of our lives. Mike's favorite text response is you are not ready. That Mike loves you are not ready. I was not ready for this. I had known about it, same as you. <clears throat> New bits and pieces of it, but I watched it. It's a great movie to watch in the middle of the day, isn't it? Like, you know, you know, with the sun outside blazing. I did. Yes, yeah, so did I. Watch this movie. I was not ready for it. And I think everything you said was spot on, the geometry of it, right? Because you have these, like, these veterans are supposed to be 
every man veterans, right? Because like Fred's from the Air Force, Al's from the Army, Homer's from the Navy. They're each in different social classes. You know, some of their experiences help them after the war. Some of their experiences don't help them after the war. What I was thinking of when I was doing the Dan, as you say, is this. Have you ever seen those military family reunion videos like on YouTube? You've seen yes. this before, right? So they show now I've watched a, a bunch of these. I've taught a class about um about you know veterans and fiction and things like that. But one of the great things I saw two great comments once on YouTube. <laughs> one of them was uh it was a whole bunch of these videos of like, you know, um, military people surprising their kids at school or like walking into the front door. And we love those videos, right? The yes. two funniest comments I saw was um, one was, um, I'm not crying. You're crying. Shut up. I'm not crying. And the second one was, I should have known not to watch this in the public library. And I think we think those they're so moving because they're, you know, you get this pure joy. You're watching like love on people's faces and it's not feigned at all. You watch these honest reactions. It gets tied up with patriotism and all these things. Now in this movie, we get some of that. Like, so when Al first comes home, when Frederick March comes home and he sees Myrna Loy, there's that great shot of them in the hallway when the two kids are watching. Isn't that great? And even the kids know like, yeah, don't let, like, let them have their moment, right? Even the camera lets them have their moment. That's great. Right. But then, of course, the rest of the movie is what happens after the video is over, what happens after the YouTube clip is over. And it reminds me very much, you said Jane Austen, this screamed out to me, the story Soldier's Home by Hemingway, right? Now, now none of these guys, maybe Homer's for a while, are as messed up as Krebs is in that story, if you know that story. But I think that it's it's it, it's so good at showing how these guys who are so brave are terrified to go back home at first. There's a great bit when they're in a taxi and they're kind of like talking about who's going to get dropped off first. And Homer's like, well, let's go get a drink first. Like these guys were on, you know, they were at Anzio and they were, you know, everywhere else, but they're, they're kind of afraid to go back home. And I think the tension of that first hour when they go on the bender with Al is, is so well done, as is the I, whole movie. I think what's really well dramatized, well, two things. First is that the war that they were in is the great equalizer. That's how these three universes can be squished down to a single universe and then essentially something that's been kept compressed is going to be allowed to expand i think that's why the movie's so long um it doesn't feel long but never it never feels long for a second the second thing is that it's clear that what was being fought for is now trying to they're, they're they're aiming at the consummation of the thing that they were trying to preserve. The problem is, if you don't approach the thing that you were trying to preserve in the right way, you yourself will break it. And I think that that's, an, it's an unspoken tension, but it made me nervous as yeah. a viewer. I think it works from the first minute. You know, if you barge right in and you put your bags down and you say everything that you saw, then the the thing that you fought for breaks. And right. I think that's Homer's problem because he would prefer not to say what he saw, but because it's a physical deformity, they can see it. And he doesn't know what to do and he doesn't know where to go and he doesn't know where to hide. He feels like he's better off dead. And the movie is him and his former comrades that he didn't even know that he had because they're in different parts of the army of the military uh, coming back together and telling him that that life is worth living. And I think that that's, what makes it so moving for me. I know a veteran who was overseas many times in, in many, many hot places. And he said that when he came back, he came back during COVID and he said, I would walk around with my mask on and my AirPods in and my hoodie up. And that was kind of like, that was my, my shell. Like, that's how I got through this because I couldn't have, I couldn't explain to anybody what it was like. Right. And, and the only people that those guys can talk to are each other. Right. The only thing like the, like in the, when they first get, when they first meet each other, when when Homer and Al and Fred all meet each other, you could tell they're like fast friends, like really quickly. Right. At the end, you're so glad that they make up that like Al and Fred aren't enemies anymore because of Peggy. Right. Th they need so desperately to talk to people, but they can only talk to each other and they can't talk to the civilians. Well, how great is it when um when Al goes to give his kids the souvenirs? He's like, this is a samurai sword. And then they're like, aren't you going to take the souvenirs? And it's like, okay, here's some stuff I found, but that's just stuff. And the, and the tension, like you said, is so good about these guys needing to talk to somebody. And like you said about Homer, Homer says, no matter what people do around me is wrong. My father either looks at my hands or he's looking away from my hands. And, and, and it sets up such a wall of Homer, especially trying to get back into Boone City. 
because I think part of the central question is how much has this experience defined you, right? right. And if you're a banker, it may not define you at all. You may have used some managerial skill uh, and and come back and then resumed your life. He gets a raise. He gets a raise, yeah. right? And for and for some people, it may have brought out the best in you, and the re the return means a a lessening of the drama and no place for your skill set. And that's why Fred can't go back to being a soda jerk. And that's why, you know, you're how much are you on Fred's side when he punches the guy? <laughs> he puts up the look like hundred percent, right? Because people shoot their mouth off and they don't know what they're talking about. And then you right, but for Homer, it's as much he feels like it's as much definition as you can possibly have. The the truth of what happened is written on his own flesh in a way that he can't hide. And what needs to happen is his whole family and the people who love him turn the tables on him and they tell him what's actually written on his flesh. It's like, it's like he can see the words, but he misinterprets them. He can't read them out loud until the scene where he gets married. Because of course, a first time viewer also the scene where Homer is practicing his marksmanship in the, when he's using the gun in the garage. And of course, the first time you go through the film, you're like, Oh, this is, you know, which way is this going to go? Like, is he going to end up using that gun on himself? Cause you can't, you can't help think about private pile in full metal jacket. Welcome back, everybody. In part two, as you know, we talk about our favorite moments or moments we think reflect the viewing of the film. Mike, what's yours? I wish I could pick a whole section of the film, which is Fred yeah. debasing himself in the soda jerk shop. And then when Peggy comes in to buy the perfume and first he's got to show it to her and then remember what it's called and then tell her how much it costs and then tell her that it's it's actually no good. It's like when they're going food shopping in Dublin Indemnity. They have to kind of make believe they're, they're shopping yeah. and having this other conversation. It's painful to watch, but the most painful is when Homer comes in for his dessert. I think he gets a slice of pie or something with ice cream on it. And there's the uh, the stranger in the corner who's telling them about the war when he's got the, the newspaper open. Um, and at first, it kind of seems like Fred's going to ignore it. But of course, Homer gets all drawn up in it. Yeah. And they try to fight, but Homer Homer can fight, but he's, he's not going right. to fight a civilian with hooks in his hand her hands um and so fred punches him and, and after they've gone through painstakingly how much each bottle of perfume costs of course that's the chekhov's gun which is they they all smash because he punches the guy through the case which is sort of a microcosm of the entire film because it's it's awkwardness that turns into pain and you think that the film like other films will let the pain quietly ferment like that's the point of the pain but the point of the pain is to give you the resolution it's the it's the consummation truly to be wished and they give it to you which is to see the guy fly through the case and fred punches him out and loses his job it's uh it's a wonderful scene but but it it operates truly the way that this film operates because again it it feels a little too long it's it's multifaceted it's got the different characters and their different mindsets but as a viewer it gives you what you truly desire right because you do not want homer and I, this is going to sound like a joke but it's not you do not want homer's pie interrupted no he he deserves he earned he, that pie he earns it more than any other character in any other film right. if anybody in the universe should be allowed to sit quietly and eat pie it's this guy absolutely so when that guy starts it's it's amazing how you're how quickly you're drawn in and how satisfied you are by what fred does and I think I can't remember the exact dialogue, but it's so beautiful how it kind of sounds like he's making sense at first. And then all of a sudden there's there's one line on which the conversation depends or suddenly turns. And it's just a stomach ache. If you're plugged into the film, you can't help but feel the pain. Right, right. And it's and I love what you said about how like a guy going on pontificating about the war who wasn't there. You know, luckily that's vanished from American life where people shoot their mouths off about things they don't know what they're talking about. Luckily, that's all behind us. So what's your moment? The equivalent of the quote unquote love scene in this movie of the scene that is so painfully intimate that you can't believe you're watching it is when Homer shows Wilma how the hook's attached to his arms. So he's he's in bed and the whole movie should be that in a lesser movie, you know, um, Wilma would be the whole drama of a lesser film would be everyone's disgusted by Homer and he becomes the elephant man. The greatness of this film is that no, like everyone is on Homer's side and he's not like this object of pity. It's different than watching the elephant man, right? Like Homer has this dignity that you very much admire. 
and his and they don't maybe not they don't know how to talk to him like his dad can't they don't know what to say like when he spills the lemonade that's really awkward but like everyone's on homer's side and homer's got to realize that so of course and of course p.s fred's wife you know would have been disgusted she just wants to see him in his uniform anyway so that bedroom scene is perfect because it it shows us something intimate we shouldn't see when wilma comes in and says you know i've loved you i loved you before I love you now. I will always love you. And he can't believe it. And she says, show me how you do this. And he says, well, then I have to do this. You have to leave the door open. I can't smoke a cigarette. I can't read a book. She says, I'll stay with you forever. She picks up the hooks and puts them on a chair. And she sits back next to him on the bed. And this is brilliant. The camera's behind them. So it's like you're, like you're eavesdropping. Like you're overhearing this thing you shouldn't hear between these two. And I think that that moment is so moving that it like it absolutely knocks the winds the wind out of me every time I see it. It was awesome. Yeah, it's it, there's a great deal of craftsmanship in this movie, both on the part of the cinematography and how it's written, which I imagine must have been a lot of script work uh, from what you described to me. But it it never feels long. It violates almost every movie principle that I could think of off the top of my head, like have them connect with one character, try to streamline the plot so that people know how to feel. <laughs> don't make the right, don't make the audience feel like an eavesdropper. The audience should not be aware that they're an audience, which I think is what you're talking about. Yeah. It's like, it, it's a Brechtian interruption that it's reminds me with you. the kids watching the parents, like I said before, like there's this, this moment that's so tender and you're watching it and it's, it works so well. Yeah. It's, uh, there's it's this truly I don't know. William Wyler is is works in awkwardness like painters work in oil. I like that we there's so many moments that we didn't even get to, yeah. um, like at the banking dinner when you think that he's going to tank the whole thing. He's t t totally drunk and then s pulls it out at the last minute. Edge of your seat. It's the equivalent of like you know every action movie where they have to defuse a bomb or something. And Myrna Loy is counting how many drinks he had with the fork with the notches on the table. And you're like, which way is, is he about to ruin his whole career? But then he like pulls it out. He does it. It's it, yeah. It's a, the the functional alcoholism. But again, that we're talking about just one brief, brief, right. brief moment of drama where any other lesser writer or director would would take any one story and make the the one thing that kind of fades into the background right. in the resolution of this film that'd be that would be the point of the film um so this film has breath but it also has depth because it doesn't it doesn't lose any single character or detail in the machinations of moving back and forth between their lives and for example, with Fred's parents, they only get a they only get a bare second to draw Fred's father and whatever the situation is going on. But you get a full sense of what his situation is, what his relation to his son is, the pride that he feels but can't express. Everything is so beautifully drawn, and that's why that's why I think the movie principles exist to begin with because it would take so much skill on the part of of somebody to keep all those plates spinning but also to have them spin straight. Uh, and this movie just says, oh, you think that's it? Here's another right. one. Right, because of course, even when even when the lead up to the scene where Wilma comes in, before Homer goes to bed, he's looking at the pictures of himself on the wall. Do you remember what the pictures are of him doing? Dribbling a basketball and, and you know, throwing a football. So there's all this baggage. And, and, and we haven't even talked about that. You said before the performances, I mean, Kathy O'Donnell plays Wilma. She's so good. And you know, they always say acting is reacting. You watch that scene again in the bedroom and just watch her. I watched it a couple of times. You just watch her face and she's not waiting to say her line. Like she is, she is all in as the ever faithful, loving Wilma looking at Homer. And of course, Harold Russell. I don't know if you know this story, but after Wyler got Harold Russell, who he had seen, Harold Russell actually lost his hands stateside um, mm -hmm. when he was in the army, He's not overseas like in the film, but he was in this training video. Wyler apparently saw it and said, this is the guy I want to get. Um, he brings him on board. Harold Russell, of course, was not an actor. Samuel Goldwood decided to start giving him acting lessons and sent him to acting lessons. And William Wyler, why he said, stop. Do not give this guy acting lessons because he didn't need them. So it's proof that you said about the plate spinning. If you have this thing perfectly written and perfectly laid out, you, you, you know, the Hitchcock, Mamet said the same thing. You, you, you tell the actor, say your lines and it will work. 
Welcome back. So in part three, of course, we always talk about the title or the ending or the key takeaways. This time, I think we should start with the ending. Dan, what's your thing on the ending? If you visit our letterbox site at 15 MIN Film, you'll see that I wrote down something to these, this effect. Can anybody think of a wedding ceremony in a film that is more moving or where you are more happy to see these two people get married? I'll wait. I, you can. I No, I can only think of a way to describe the scene to somebody who knows classic film but hasn't seen the best years of our lives, which is, it's like the end of Stella Dallas, but you're invited. Everyone's invited. Everyone's invited. The house is all done up. That's great. I love how at the ending, when they're looking at each other, when Wilma and Homer are looking at each other, there's also another entire movie going on because Fred and Peggy are looking at each other in the background. That is so, they're on the left side of the screen, Homer and Wilma on the right side, and you don't know which movie to watch because these two, these two sets of the Venn diagram have intersected in this space, but the two of them are just thinking like, we, we have to do this as well. And I think that that's so moving. And that's why I think the movie gets to end with, with Peggy talking to I agree. Fred. And again, from a film structure perspective, you just should not be allowed to get away with that. You should only be, you're allowed one. It, it shouldn't work, but it really does. What do you make of the title? The title's interesting because, well, I'll, I'll state the obvious and then you can respond to the obvious, sure. which is if you call the movie the best years of our lives and they're returning from the front, the question is, which years were the best and to whom, right? If if you're Fred and you get back and you, you're supposed to go back to your fast food job, but people have been looking to you to save their lives a second before, but all you want, but during those moments when you're saving lives, all you wanted to be was home. What are the best years of, of your lot, of your life? It's It's very difficult to define. Because when he was there, of course, you know, uh, the the he lost the guy and so that's why he comes back and he has nightmares and he keeps saying the guy's name the guy's name over and over so it's hard to say which are the best but yeah 100 percent which ones are the best the title is both um at the very end you know these are going to be the best years of homer's life and the other characters as well but you know it's also ironic when they first get in it's a strange it's a strange film to title you know like i said before the novel was titled glory for me and that's also, you know, ironic, but it, it's a strange title to to give onto this story. And I will say in terms of, in terms of the resolution you get, but what you expect when the movie starts, you assume that the best use of their lives could have been in the past before they went, right? If you're Homer and there's pictures of you dribbling the basketball, college athlete, whatever it is, or high school athlete, whatever it is, right? You assume that 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 was the best year of your life and now you're in pieces, right? If you're Fred, you might assume that seeing action were the best years of his life and now it's over. Like he got a brief interim of, of heroism and, and now it's over. But the movie insists that the best years of their lives are to come, that, they, that they're actually in the future. And so I think kind of the dramatic movement from the past to the present and then on into the future is the resolution that all these characters deserve. Yeah, because of course, when you're to say that years in the past were the best years of your lives, that requires distance and time and and it's nostalgia, which this movie never does. Like it never it never makes the war this this subject of nostalgia. It never does, right? Um, so I think yeah, it's it's coming forward, and that's kind of it's almost like you watch the entire film, and then like the, then the title card should come on and say now. Here come the best years of your lives. I, th I think the brilliance of avoiding nostalgia comes from a sense of physical comfort. Like when, when Fred flips himself up into the plane cockpit and knows exactly where to sit and feels totally comfortable. And he, he just wants to get back. He wants to get back to a place where he knows where everything is, where he could close his eyes and reach out his hand and know where certain things are, which it is the sense of home that you get not from a home being a home, but from, from an understanding or from an exposure to it, right? And and you, you can tell that he's so unbelievably uncomfortable either at his father's home or at the apartment that his wife's picked out or it being a guest in somebody else's apartment. There's no place for him until finally you go to the airplane graveyard and you find out where his place really is. And so... Right. Nostalgia is a longing for a place you can't get back to. 
I think the beauty of it is that you can find the used up uh, planes in the graveyard where they ostensibly belong and flip yourself up into them. I think that the the film is kind of on this at least the same track that I am because they're going to make the planes into like they're going to use the metal for houses or something or yeah they're they're yeah. turn they're they're using the metal to yeah. construct houses and so that that's at least how I I think that the the film is winking or hinting or pointing yeah. at the same thing right if if you can't get back to where you should have been if there's a great gulf of the war between where you are now and where you want to go then it's nostalgia uh, and this is all about small town Americana, which I don't think it's about at all. But if it's about an exposure to a place where you feel comfortable, where you feel competent and where you know everything is, you still can get back there. And I think that the the fact that you can get back there is part of the film's appeal. You can go home again. Great pick. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation about the best years of our lives. You could follow us on Twitter at 15MINFilm. You could also follow us where, Mike? Letterbox. Letterbox. So follow us on Letterbox. We're also on YouTube. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time.